Hey y'all, I'm here. So today we're going to take a look at how to dual boot Linux Mint with Windows. I'm going to be demonstrating on Windows 10, but these same steps for sure work on 8.1 and shouldn't be too different on older versions. I'll note anywhere that won't necessarily be exactly the same. So starting out with some stuff that won't vary Pull up your favorite browser and point it to linuxmint.com and if you want you can scroll around, click around a bit to figure out what Linux Mint even is, but when you're ready to bite the bullet, go to download, click on whatever is at the far left here, right now it's 20.2. If you watch far enough in the future, it could be some higher number. Then there are three different versions available. They'll all look pretty similar. Cinnamon has the most fancy bells and whistles. XFCE is the most lightweight, so it's a good choice for potatoes, and mate is just sort of a middle ground between those. I'd say closer to the lightweightness of XFCE than it is to Cinnamon's Bells and Whistles, but just click whichever one sounds best to you. And I just remembered the documentation link. I think talks a bit more about these three options. Then just kind of pick any nearby mirror or if you have a BitTorrent client for exactly this reason and other legitimate purposes, the torrent link is going to be a lot faster. You can see I already got mine started in advance because I knew this was going to be a while for me. And then the other download while that's going. I can get to this tab. <laughs> so go to rufus.ie or just. I was going to say, or do a search for Rufus in your favorite search engine, but. That'll probably bring up a lot of other download links, so yeah, just go straight to the actual website and just sort of scroll down. Let the record show that I am attempting to scroll right now. <laughs> and then I tend to go for the portable version because I know for a fact that that's not going to require me to actually install anything. I'm just going to try clicking that again because I don't know if that actually took. Alright, now it's going. Inoni-chan is trying her best. Alright. It's just going to let those download and also, I should probably note with Rufus, first I should note what it does, and then that there are other ways. So, Rufus is for making a bootable USB, which you can then install Linux Mint off of. So, you point it to a flash drive, point it at an ISO file. If I recall correctly, most of the rest of this just autofills from that. And then just click start, and it'll make a bootable USB based off that ISO. Other programs like Belena Etcher exist. Rufus is just what I'm personally used to and comfortable with. Anyway, while those download, there are a couple things that are best to set up from the Windows side. So, one of them, just right-click the Start menu or hit Windows X. 
then go to disk management. So we're going to be playing with partitions. Now technically the Linux Mend installer does have an install alongside Windows option that lets you shrink the partition from there. And if you're more comfortable with that, you can wait and do it that way. I just kind of prefer to do it from Windows, because I figure Windows is going to have a bit more of an idea of what files have been put where on any Windows partition than the Linux Mend installer necessarily would. And also on older versions of Windows, like if you're still rocking XP or anything, Old Wisdom says that you should defragment before shrinking the partition. On newer versions like 8.1, 10, and I think 7, it defragments as a scheduled task, so shouldn't get too fragmented. So then just right-click the C drive, shrink volume, It'll check for how much it can shrink by. And with my super high-end, like, 10-year-old laptop, this could take a sec. <laughs> okay, so gives you the total size the amount you can shrink by, the editable field, which is how much you actually want to shrink it by, and then how much space just if you shrink it by this amount. So I'm gonna go for just even 32,000 mags, just a nearly 50-50 split. Then let it shrink. Then you can leave this as unallocated and use Mint's installer to make a partition in this space, or you can set up a partition now and just reformat it in Mint's installer. I generally like to just make a partition while I'm here anyway. I'm gonna just not assign a drive letter because I'm not gonna be using this from Windows. Then the default should be fine. Volume label, I think, will be visible, so you can just go for, like, mint use this or something. And just kind of let that do its thing. And that is one of... I don't know why that says raw... Okay, now it's NTFS. Yeah, so that's one of the things you need to do. Then for the other, pull up the start menu. Just do a search for control might be enough for control panel to pop up. I mean, regardless, control panel is what you want. So just kind of type as much of control panel as it takes. Then, it's been a bit since I did this. I think it might be under hardware and sound. Yeah, then power options, change what the power buttons do. And since this is a VM with questionable drivers at best, the relevant option isn't showing up here, but 
under shutdown settings, there's a good chance, especially on newer versions, like I know 8 and newer have this, I don't remember if 7 does, it's called like quick boot or fast startup or something like that. You're going to want to change settings that are currently unavailable and then uncheck the box for fast startup because what that does is basically tells Windows that when you hit shut down you actually mean just hibernate so that can lead to some issues with dual booting like if you want to access the Windows partition at all it won't let you and in some cases it can even like keep you from booting to grub or whatever bootloader your distro of choice uses so yeah if you have that option be sure it's unchecked and looks like the mint download is still going strong so i'm just gonna pause the video until that's downloaded so i can show off how to use rufa actually i'm gonna see if i can just run rufus without actually having the ice hopefully downloaded and looking at the shield here depending on your uic settings you might need to right click and run as administrator oh no smart screen can't be reached uh, i'm just gonna run it anyway And I do definitely want to let Rufus make changes to whatever it wants. And typically Rufus would start up faster than this, but this is a Windows 10 VM running on a machine that I'm pretty sure could barely handle it bare metal. Yeah, so I think I briefly touched on this on the Rufus page, but device, it will wipe this drive, so you want to make sure that it's the flash drive you want to wipe. Good way to check is to just go to Windows Explorer and see what's in whatever drive it's pointing to. In my case, I only have one flash drive that this VM can see, so that's for sure the right one. And you're going to want to select disk or ISO image. And then select once, <laughs> once this VM figures its life out. Should bring up a file picker that if I had the ISO fully downloaded would let me point it to that. <laughs> I'm starting to feel like there's a slight chance that I'll still need to pause the video just <laughs> to wait for Rufus to not be unresponsive. Okay, looks like it's kind of responding, so... I was going to say I might not need to pause, but honestly I should have just paused recording by this point. Okay, there's the file picker. So just go to wherever you downloaded the ISO. Right now, since my download's still going, it's not finding any ISO files, but if it was fully downloaded. 
then you would select that partition scheme and target system should be fine. Honestly, all of the defaults beyond that should be fine. It does have advanced format options, which if you're using this specifically to format a flash drive, which would be non-bootable, I think, then some of these could be useful, or if you want to check the flash drive. But for most use cases, the defaults are good. And then once you'd selected it, you would just click start. And then after that does its thing, you just need to close whatever you're doing, restart the machine, and the exact process for booting off a flash drive depends on your device and manufacturer. Typically Dells and I think a lot of Acers and at least Lenovo ThinkPads, you spam F12 early in boot for the boot menu. HP I think is usually F9 or F10. One of those is boot menu, the other is BIOS, I don't remember which is which. And especially on newer machines there might be some settings in BIOS that you need to tweak to get it to boot off a flash drive. So just kind of look into that for your specific machine. And I'm just gonna pause recording and then come back once I've booted to a Linux Mint ISO. Okay, so just one little note for anyone who's not used to any Linux stuff. When you hit the scrub menu, you might be a little intimidated by all the different options. If it doesn't auto-boot, just go for the default. Also just going to take this as an opportunity to note that although I'm going to be using an ISO of 20.1 just because I already have that downloaded, the process should be exactly the same for 20.2 and for whatever later versions. And I don't remember how long this normally takes to boot on my potato, so I don't actually remember if it's worth pausing recording for or not. Alright, guess that's not really worth pausing. So, if you want, this is a good time to take a look around see to some extent what sort of stuff you're working with, but more so just how supported any of your hardware is. I don't have desktop audio enabled for OBS, but I can tell you with absolute certainty after that startup chime that sound is definitely working. And... Looks like the Ethernet works, which, well, virtual Ethernet, which pretty much any Ethernet adapter will. Could be good to check your wireless card. If you have especially a Broadcom wireless card, you'll probably end up needing to install one or two additional packages after installing Mint. But yeah, once you're reasonably sure that everything's in good working order. Just double click this thing that says install. Because surprisingly enough, the icon labeled install Linux Mint lets you install Linux Mint. So it'll start by asking your language. So for me, English is right. Then continue. And keyboard layout. 
I have a normal QWERTY keyboard, so English US, English US is right. If you don't know the exact name of yours, like there's at least five different Dvoraks here, and there's this nice little box where you can just start typing stuff. Ideally, you would like actually check keys instead of just keyboard spamming. Yeah, once that's right, should continue. And multimedia codecs are rather useful. I know some sites don't work quite right without them, like I think if you use Twitter, videos on there require some proprietary codecs that wouldn't necessarily be installed by default. Actually, I don't think it's even like proprietary implementations. I think there's just patents involved. But yeah, so that's a nice box to check if you plan on actually using this install for any meaningful span of time. Which this is a dual boot video, so if you're installing it as a dual boot, I kind of hope you plan to actually use it. I completely forgot how long this step in particular takes for some reason. And since we did the manual partitioning, I don't remember off the top of my head whether we need to go for something else or if install alongside will work properly, so I'm just going to try install alongside, and if it doesn't work... Okay, looks like it just picked a partition to split, so let's go to the advanced partitioning tool. Let it scan the disks for a sec. Okay, so there's a couple different NTFS partitions. I was really hoping that it would actually show the label that was assigned to it. But since I gave the secondary partition a little less space, the slightly smaller one is right, and for a better way to check. This one that has Windows on it has like 12,000 megs in use. This one has 72 megs in use, so I'm gonna say that's probably the right one. Let's just kind of change that. Use as X4 is a good default. Definitely format it and mount point slash. I don't actually know why it's asking this, but I'm just gonna let it continue now. And then just give it a sec to figure out what it's changed. And also just to explain why I didn't choose this third NTFS partition, that one's extra small, I'm guessing it's like recovery or something. So yeah, this is being used as slash, then one with type EFI if you have a UEFI system, which is the default for 8 and newer and might be supported on Windows 7. 
reasonably sure nothing older than that supports it. Yeah, that just uses EFI system partition. And if for whatever reason that doesn't work, then I'll just come back afterward and just add a little, hey, I'm stupid, here's what you actually do thing. So then, when you hit install now, I'm pretty sure it'll prompt you just saying, here's what's going to change, are you sure you want to change this? And I mean, if I'm wrong, you'll get to see in this video, okay, it did not prompt for anything, so hopefully that setup's right. Now, where are you isn't like some fancy geolocation thing, this is just time zone, so if you're anywhere in U.S. Central, Chicago will be right, otherwise just kind of Click wherever seems closest on the map, and it'll figure out something. And then continue. And then name. Most of the screen is pretty self-explanatory. Computer's name. You can just kind of set to whatever you want. Username will autofill when you type your name. Up to you whether you want to keep it that way. And then password. For a proper dual boot setup that you're actually using, you should pick something secure but memorable for VM that I'm probably going to delete right after this video is recorded. I'm just going to go with whatever. And you can set it to log in automatically, but if you're kind of bad at remembering passwords, or if there are other people at, in your house or whatever that you don't necessarily trust, it's better to require a password and as for how bad it would be to forget it, Windows UAC just kind of prompts you with, hey, this thing wants to be admin, click a button to let it run as admin. Whereas Linux has an actual security feature and makes you type your password to give Chef root permissions, which is kind of equivalent to administrator, kind of less safeties on there, but yeah, so rambling aside, require password to log in is generally a good thing, and if you want, you can also encrypt your home folder, just like documents, pictures, videos, all that. And then continue, and once it loads, there will be a nice little Yep, slideshow, just sort of telling you what Linux Mint is all about. It's like some of the stuff that's available. You can use Firefox, it's installed by default. Netflix works in Firefox. YouTube works in basically any modern browser. You can get Spotify and Rhythmbox off the software center after you finished installing. Just goes over some media players. I don't know why I'm giving you this guided tour. Like, I'm pretty sure anyone watching this can click and read without me helping. Yeah, so just kind of take a look at the slideshow as it installs, or you can just kind of walk away and not look at the slideshow. And I'm just gonna pause recording until this finishes installing.
Alright, so after finishing the installation, obviously you're going to want to restart. And assuming everything worked okay, first boot, you're going to want to try and boot to Windows, as weird as that sounds. This might just be booting off the CD, or it might be a shutdown chef. Yeah, this is a shutdown chef. Well, I just casually apply that and just eject that. Yeah, so first boot, you're going to want to try booting to Windows just so you can make sure that it a still boots to Windows properly and B doesn't hijack the boot process. Cause that is pretty much the main issue that some people run into with dual booting. Let's just give Windows a sec to boot up. I'm probably just gonna like make a cut here or something. After booting back to Windows I just realized that I didn't actually, like, go over how to make sure that Windows and Mint are both going to read hardware time the same way. So I'll probably just link to some wiki page about that. Because I know there is a way to change the way Windows does it to match how Linux does, but I don't actually remember it off the top of my head. Yeah, so after booting back to Windows, if you don't have any urgent business here, you don't actually need to sign in. Just restart. Restart anyway, and make sure that it still takes you to that same boot menu. And if it does still take you there, then you should be good to go. At least until Windows Update decides to do weird things, but I personally haven't run into that, so you might be fine. Yeah, as you can see, brought me back to the grub menu, so I can just start up Linux Mint and be reasonably confident that Windows isn't gonna steal the boot process anytime soon. So yeah, that's pretty much all I felt like covering in this video, so yeah, hopefully this helped someone. Have a nice rest of your day.